Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, a passage that I began last week concerning this title, Our Greater and Eternal High Priest. And as I said last week, I decided to move slow through these first eight or nine, ten verses because this is such an important subject to the people of God the high priestly office of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you followed along when Brother Jim was reading that prayer, you have recorded there as the Holy Spirit inspired the the Apostle John to record it, the high priestly prayer of the Savior, the Son of God speaking to the Father in the Spirit, on behalf of the people of God. That's a marvelous thing. And I know know, we kind of tease each other when I ask people, or I ask either Randy or I ask Jim or I ask Mark to read, well, it's his turn, it's his turn, you know. They're not reluctant to read. But when I told Jim, I said, read John 17, and he come in this morning, he was kind of on fire. He's almost like he wanted to preach. So come on, Jim. (laughs) It's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? That's the Lord's Prayer. And in that, you know, last week I made mention of this, you know, that uh, in reading out out of the epistle to Timothy where Paul wrote, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that is a a set in concrete truth. There's one way to God. Not many ways. And I'll tell you, this is what... One of the things that's offensive to the natural man, especially people today, they want to think, well, there are many ways to God. There's one way to God. And Christ said it. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. Peter spoke it. He he said, there's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ by the sovereign, free, full grace of God. And so when we think of him as our mediator, our go-between, he's, he, he stands in between the Father and his people, his chosen people. There are basically three offices. Christ is our prophet. Christ is our priest. And that's what we're studying here in Hebrews 5, his qualifications to be the one and only high priest of spiritual Israel, the church, the people of God. And then he's our king. But what's so important about his high priestly office is this. And this is why every believer ought to study this. In fact, if you look there at Hebrews chapter 5, if you'll look down at verse 13, which we'll be getting to in the next coming weeks, he says, everyone that useth milk, the milk being the word of God there, uh, uh, he says, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's obeyed, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, that is full grown. What he's talking about there, he's he's urging the people of God to grow in grace and in knowledge and to become skillful in the word of righteousness, the gospel, that tells us of the glorious person and the finished work of Christ. And and I always look at it this way, and I I know you all will agree with this, don't let the preacher do your thinking for you. (laughs) Now, I preach to you. The word of God. But you think about these things. You study to show yourself to be approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And the reason that it's so important. That we understand this work of Christ. The high priest is this. His high priestly office. And the fulfillment of the duties of that office. For his people. Is the very foundation. And ground of our whole existence. As sinners saved by grace. Now, remember I said there are three offices, prophet, priest, and king. Unless Christ fulfilled the duties of his office as high priest, there'd be no prophecy. There'd be no, there'd be no uh, what is a prophet? One who tells the word of God. There'd be, and we think of it as the good news, the gospel. Well, Christ is our, great high, is our great prophet, but if he hadn't done his duty and fulfilled the office of a high priest, there'd be nothing good to tell. Did you know that? Be no good news for sinners like us if Christ had not fulfilled his duties as our high priest. 
What did the high priest do? He represented the people before God. That's what Christ is doing for his people. It's what he has done and what he is doing. Representing God's chosen people, the elect, before holy God. What did the high priest do? He brought in the sacrifice, the blood. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. And he offered the sacrifice on behalf of the people. And the human high priest did it for himself and for the people. Christ did it for his people. Not for himself, but for the people. Having our sins charged to him. He brought the blood of the sacrifice, and that was his own blood. He's the Lamb of God. And that's what the priest did. And so he, he offered himself without spot unto God. Well, we talk about his kingly office. Well, if he had not performed the duties of his office as high priest, there'd be no kingdom. His kingdom is a righteous kingdom, a righteous scepter. There'd be no righteousness. So that's how important this, this thing is. So let's look here at Hebrews chapter 5. I'll move a little bit quicker through here, but there are several points. Last week I majored on this first point that shows forth the glorious person of Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? And it says here in verse 1, it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men. That's speaking of the humanity of Christ. Every one of those old covenant priests under the old covenant, they were human beings, sinful human beings. But in order to, in order to stand for, in order to represent men from among men, the high priest had to be a man. Now Christ, this speaks of his holy, harmless, sinless humanity. That he is. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God, man. That's who he is. He's the word made flesh. He had to be made human. He had to be conceived in the womb of the virgin by the Holy Spirit. Not with the aid of man. Not in the usual way. But without man. He's the seed of woman, the scripture says. He had to be born of the virgin. Without sin. He had to have a holy humanity in order to represent Human beings. So Christ as the sinless God-man stood as our high priest representing men. Man, human, human be, sinful human beings. And that, that's generic. In other words, God's chosen people. Male, female. Black, white. Out of every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation. That's who he represented. Remember the high priest I made mention is he had 12 names on that breastplate. The names of the tribes of the Israel. And that's who Christ has on his breastplate, as it were, his heart, his chosen people. He prayed for him. He said, oh, those whom thou hast given me. When were they given to him? Before the foundation of the world. God chose them and gave them to Christ. That's what the scripture teaches. Remember, John recorded where the Lord said, all that the Father hath given me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You, ask, you may ask yourself this question. Am I, one, am I among that number that was given to him? Well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you calling upon the name of the Lord? The Lord of glory. The Lord in this book. Jesus Christ as he's identified and distinguished in the word of God. So Christ is very God of very God, the old writers used to say, and very man of very man without sin. And we read about that, how, how he uh, uh, was made manifest. He's God manifest in the flesh. And then the second, the second uh, point here is the glory of God in Christ. Look at verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. In other words, this is all about the glory, the majesty, the beauty, the goodness of the grace, the mercy of God. It's all about his glory. It's not about you and me. It's, this is not, you see, our gospel, the true gospel is not a humanistic gospel. It doesn't begin and end with man. It's not conditioned on man. It's all conditioned on Christ, the God-man. <laughs> and it's to the praise of the glory of his grace in the, in the person and work of Jesus Christ as the representative, the surety, the substitute, the redeemer, the intercessor of his people. In Christ, we see the fullness of the glory of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. 
how every attribute of God's nature is honored, magnified, working consistently together to glorify God in the salvation of his people. You see, God's reputation is the issue here, not yours, not mine. We have no reputation. We're sinners. <laughs> we're nothing. <laughs> He's everything, and we're nothing. This is not about applauding us. It's not about lifting us up as far as our reputation and our works. The only lifting up that we go through is he reaches down by the power of his grace and he lifts the beggars off the dung heap. That's it. One old brother used to say, he said, before I was saved, my address was Dung Hill Drive. That's what we are by nature. Spirit, we fell in Adam. We rebelled, born dead in trespasses and sins. This is not about the power or goodness that we have. It's not about even our decisions. People say, well, just, you know, you've got to, you've got to do the right thing. You've got... We don't know how to do the right thing by nature. Not in God's sight now. I'm not talking about as men and women see us on this plane. But in God's sight, he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good, no, not one. According to God's measure of goodness, not man's. You see, mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa, brother and sister, they'll all look at you and say, you're such a good guy, or you're such a good lady. But here's the issue. How do we stand in God's sight according to his measure of goodness, his measure of righteousness? The Bible says that he commands us to repent in Acts 17.30 because in verse 31 he says there, God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. And what is, who is the standard of righteousness? By that man whom he hath ordained in that he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. How righteous must I be? To enter the glory of God, the glory of heaven, glory of eternity. I must be as righteous as Christ. I told a man that one time, he looked, his eyes got that big, and he said, well, nobody can do that. I said, that's right. And that's why salvation is by grace and not by works. And grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I must have his righteousness charged to me, imputed to me. That's what it's all about. That's the glory of God. That's how God can be just and justify the ungodly. And then the third thing here is the justice of God fulfilled by Christ. That high priest in verse 1 here, he is, he is taken from among men. He's ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Now, for sins. Now, everything that God accepts, everything that God blesses, is found by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. First of all, there's the gifts there. That's talking about the, those offerings. The, we can look at it in our case as the offering of praise. The offering of worship to God. But it's all based upon the sacrifice, which is the blood offering. You remember how the Old Testament high priest, he'd go into the, one day on the Day of Atonement, he would go into the holiest of all with the blood of a lamb. And he'd sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. What does that teach us? That teaches us the, the biblical concept called propitiation. What does that mean? Well, let me put it to you this way. God is a merciful God. And that, you know, that, that, mercy, that was called the mercy seat. He's a merciful God. The Bible says all over the place, in the book of Psalms especially, he delights to show mercy. God is a God of love. God is love, the scripture says. God is a God of grace. But here's what people aren't hearing today. God's grace, God's mercy, God's love cannot be shown towards sinners except on a righteous, just ground. And that's where that blood comes in. The soul that sinneth must surely die. The wages of sin is death. God, does, God must be a righteous judge. 
as well as a loving, merciful Father. And that's where the gospel issue comes. How can a holy God, how can he show mercy and grace and love to a sinner like me who deserves nothing but his just, just wrath, who has earned nothing but his, his anger, how can he look at me and show mercy and still be just? How can he be gracious to me and still be righteous? How can he love me and still be truthful? Somebody said, well, doesn't God love everybody? No. Scripture says he hated Esau. Psalm 5 says he hates all workers of iniquity. Aren't I a worker of iniquity? Well, is there any way that God can look at me and not charge me with iniquity? Well, my friend, behold the wisdom, the glory, the mercy of God in Christ Jesus as the great high priest who stood in my place and took my punishment, took my wrath based on my sins charged to him. He paid my debt in full. He satisfied the justice of God. That's what propitiation is. He satisfied the justice of God on behalf of his sheep. The ones he prayed for in John 17. He said, I finished the work. What did he do? He was speaking in anticipation of his death on the cross. Shedding his precious blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, people have the idea today that God can, he's just so much of a loving uh, sentimental grandpapa that he can just you know he wouldn't send anybody to hell he wouldn't punish anybody oh no you better look at the bible oh but that's the god of the old testament oh no that's the god of the new testament too he's the same god friend he saves one way he shows mercy and love and grace one way and that's through christ and let me tell you something outside of christ there's no mercy outside of christ there's no grace Outside of Christ, listen to me, there's no love from God. It's only hatred. man told me one time, he said, well, it's not right for God to hate anything. I told him, I said, it's nothing but right. You see, God's hatred isn't like ours. Our hatred is usually sinful, selfish, self-serving, personal. God's hatred is his just wrath against sinners where, to whom sin is imputed. To whom, that's why David prayed, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. How is that possible? Only in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the issue. That's the justice of God. And everything we are as believers... Everything we are as sinners saved by grace is accepted with God as far as, as anything that we do in order to please God. It's accepted not based upon our merits, not based upon our good intentions, not based upon our resolutions. It's based upon the blood of Jesus Christ. We're accepted in the beloved, the scripture says. We offer sacrifices and praises unto God acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, here's the fourth thing. Here's the love of God in Christ for his chosen people. Look at verse 2. This high priest, one of the requirements, he had to be one who can, it says, who can reasonably bear with, is what it says there in your concordance, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And it says, verse 3, And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. The high priest of Israel, these human high priests under the old covenant, had to offer sacrifices on their own behalf as well as for the people because they themselves were sinners. 
And it was required of the high priest that he have compassion. Why? Because he was no better than anybody else. That's why. Because he too was a weak human being, a sinner who was in need of God's grace. This human high priest now under the old covenant, the line of Aaron. And in the exercise of this office, he was never to be lifted up with pride as if he deserved to be there. He was never to be lifted up with self-righteousness, looking down on the people he represented. And I'll be the first to tell you, if you read the history of Israel, many of them failed in this. The reality, you see. But see, the whole point of the book of Hebrews is that Christ is better. Christ is greater. Christ is eternal. Just like the, the blood sacrifices. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. They accomplished some things. They accomplished what we call a, a ceremonial, temporal washing. Hebrews 9 tells us about that. But it didn't accomplish the putting away of sins in the sight of God. It did not, they, they did not accomplish the spiritual, eternal cleansing. See, it took something better than the blood of actual lambs and goats and bullocks. What did it take to put away our sin? It took the blood of the God-man. <laughs> the blood of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said. That's the sins of God's people all over this world, isn't it? He's got a people out of every tribe, kindred. Let me tell you something. If he took away your sins on that cross, there's no way you can perish. That's right. Sin cannot be charged to you if he took them away. And why did he do all that? It was because of the love of God for his people. You see, Christ didn't come into the world to die for his people to make God love them. He came into the world to die for God's people because God already loved them eternally. And Christ himself, as God-man, even though him, he himself was not a sinner, he was never made a sinner, he was never contaminated. Listen, he was made sin, the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5.21. What does that mean? That means all the sins of all of God's people were made to meet on him. He bore our sins. And what that means is that God charged him with the demerit of our sins. He he, they were imputed to him. They were accounted to him. He took our debt. But he was never contaminated with that sin. He was never transformed into something called sin. Do you know that on the cross, Christ, as guilty by imputation, the imputation of our sins, the accounting of our sins, Christ bore under the wrath of God, but in himself he remained perfect, holy, pure, pure, Separate from sinners? He never, on the cross, when he was, look at the seven saints on the cross. Do they reek of any sinfulness? Remember the thief on the cross on the right hand? He started out blaspheming God, didn't he, with the other thief. Then all of a sudden something changed. <laughs> oh, he, uh, I guess he heard the organ playing softly. Or he heard the preacher down to Al begging him to accept G. no. The power of God came upon that man. And he was made willing in the day of God's power. And God changed his will, didn't he? <laughs> changed his heart. But you see, Christ on that cross, he had compassion on the weak. He had com Think about his earthly ministry. He had compassion on the sick and the poor. Because he identified with us, not in our sinfulness, but in the infirmities of the flesh, the weaknesses of the flesh. He had a human body without sin. You know that word compassion here in verse 2. It speaks of being passionately affected. It speaks of one who is not unduly disturbed by the errors, faults, and sins of others. <laughs> but he bears them gently. You know, that's how Christ could sit down 
and have a meal with publicans and sinners. <laughs> he could do that. That shocked the religious majority. That shocked the Pharisees and the self-righteous. But he had compassion. And he even made a statement like this. He said, they'll enter into the kingdom of heaven before you religious folk will. Think about that. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's amazing. In Matthew 9.36, you know, when he saw the multitudes, it says, He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. That's the way they were. Till we see Christ, we're like sheep that have no shepherd. And this is significant. You know, his, and I want you to notice, you know, his compassion for them did not cause him to compromise the glory of God and God's truth to gain their favor and approval. He had compassion on them, but he didn't speak peace to them. He dealt with them more gently than he did with the Pharisees, but he didn't lie to them in the name of love and compassion. Over Matthew 15, he turned to the same multitude in verse 32. Listen to this. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days. They have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. So he had compassion on them. But listen to what he said in John chapter 6. This is John chapter 6 and verse 26. I've got the wrong reference because there's not 26 verses in John 26. But what he did is he turned toward the multitude and he told them, he said, you follow me not for the miracles, that miracle which testified that he is God. He says, you follow me just for the loaves and the fishes. He knew their hearts. So he had compassion because of the feeling of our infirmities. But there's a very significant difference between the human high priest under the old covenant and Christ, the God-man, who is high priest under the covenant of grace. And that's it. this. Christ had no sin and Christ knew no sin. He did no sin. He is and was the perfect God-man. And that's an amazing thing. That was a qualification that he had to have for that. I said that I had the wrong reference, but I didn't. I just turned to the wrong page. But look at verse 26 of John 6. Usually I have these little markers. They, they call them cheaters, you know. And people say, well, how can you find those verses so fast? Well, I got a little marker there. But I forgot to put one here. But here it is. John 6, 26. I did have it set right. It says, Jesus answered them. John 6, 26, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles. Now, what he's saying there is those miracles were a testimony from God that Christ, that Jesus of Nazareth, is, was, and is God. And he's saying, you're not following me because you believe I'm the Messiah. He says, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. You just want your physical hunger filled up. And then he says, labor not for the meat which perish, but that meat which perish is not. Well, Christ had no sin. He knew no sin. He was the spotless sacrifice. Well, then how could he have justly died for our sins? Well, the same way that God could justly save and justify sinners like us. He bore the sins of his sheep. He said, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Who were his sheep. That's God's chosen people. Given to him before the foundation of the world. Who fell in Adam. Into sin and death. Born dead in trespasses and sins. Sinners. That's what we are. And he bore our sins. He took our penalty. Our sins charged to him. And in exchange we get what? His righteousness. By which we stand before God. Whole. Justified. And from him. We get spiritual life, a new heart, born again to look to him and rest in him 
and plead him as our one mediator between God and men, to rest in him as our one and only high priest who passed through into the heavens on our behalf so that we might have free access, unhindered access to the throne of grace and find help and mercy in time of need. That's our great high priest. There's no one better. There's no one greater. There's no one else. It's all him.